early holiday savings have arrived at Tanger Outlets. Discover the best gifts from your favorite brands, perfect for everyone on your list. And stack your savings with up to 70% off, plus an extra 15 to 25% off only during Tanger Style. Save at Polo Ralph Lauren, Old Navy Outlet, Under Armour, Skechers, J. Crew Factory, and more. Hurry in. These early holiday deals last through November 24th. Tanger Outlets. More savings, more cheer. From the 600 ESPN El Paso River Oaks Property Schoolyard Sports Studio, here's Steve Kaplowitz and Adrian Broadus. And welcome back, everybody, as we get ready on a Tuesday afternoon, coming your way live from the District West 3233 North Mesa, where guess what? Right now, we've got Taco Tuesday out here. Dollar fifty hard and soft shell tacos, two fifty tecate and tecate lights, three fifty hornitos, and guess what? We're also getting you ready for UTEP basketball, which uh, will include tickets to tonight's game, which will be tipping off three hours from now. The miners back in action, and great to have you back here on Sports Talk as we get going with Alberto Dueta back at our six hundred ESPN El Paso River Oaks property schoolyard sports studios. Sebastian Perez Navarro on location, and along with Adrian Broadus, Steve Kaplowitz back with you, ready to go. We've got Bernie Olivas coming up in about an hour for the Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl watch. I feel so good uh, about this contest. I feel like I could skip the last week and have <laughs> nothing to worry about, but we will talk about that a little bit later in the show. In the meantime, Adrian, appreciate you hosting for me yesterday. Um, and, and that was great having you out at Border City Yale House for Monday Night Football. And the Rams just, uh, well, couldn't get it done oh, against uh, a Dolphins team that, let's be honest, looked better last night than they have in a while. Yeah, they were causing so much havoc on that D-line against Matthew Stafford. He never felt comfortable the entire game. And, and the Rams could not get the run game going. That's kind of been their uh, M.O. over the past couple weeks. But I read that Dolphins offensive attack. The biggest issue that we saw from the Dolphins is that, you know, at, at times, Steve, they, Steve, they look good. But then Tua made some costly turnovers. It felt like Miami probably should have won by much more than they did. Rams did not capitalize on any red zone appearances that they had. It was all offense for yep. L.A. I don't know about the Rams right now at 4-5 and five on the season. Meanwhile, maybe uh, you know the Dolphins have some life to their season now that they have Tua uh, back uh, you know, for the rest of this season. And then their defense is starting to play some really good football. Their defense is playing some really good football. You're right about that. So, you never know. Three-win team, anything's possible, right? Anything is possible. And it's a great way to uh, kind of begin the show today out here at the District West. Hanging with you. Sebastian, it's your first trip out here to the district. Uh, what's your impression of this place? I feel like a fifth grader whenever they get taken out on a field trip. I've never <laughs> been here. This lawn is beautiful. They're playing Texas football from 2005. It's one of the chillest places I've ever been to. The wind is making it great. It's an extraordinary Tuesday, to say the least. How about that? I like that. He is ordinary Tuesday. You know, and the wind is nice. I'll be honest, it's a, it's a comfortable day out here today. It's a great way to spend it. Spend it with your friends Tuesday. Spend it with your friends on 600 ESPN El Paso and have an opportunity to go watch UTEP basketball a little bit later on. Yeah, we've got some great uh, prizes here today. Steve, we've got tickets for the game here tonight. So if you need tickets for UTEP taking on UT Permian Basin, we've got tickets available. We've got great sunglasses, great giveaways, thanks to the Oscar ID at the agency. We've got a Win the West t-shirt to raffle off. Two hats that are really nice. I know you, you like this Texas Western hat, Steve. I do. I love this one myself. And then we even have a nice UTEP fleece that we're going to be raffling off later on here on the program. Really excited about this one as well so all of that is uh is here at the district west 32 33 north mesa here celebrating for taco tuesday is it me or are we starting to see from so many different places around the country some really cool UTEP merch these days. Man, we, we've we seen some recently. Uh, you know, I was reached out to the team over with Stephon Jackson, and yes, he still has a team. He's been retired from playing pro basketball for a while. He just launched his jersey. And then, Steve, you sent me today the throwback vintage UTEP uh, you know, swag that's being sold out there. I just love 
like between the bookstore that is really up their game for UTEP merchandise, different websites that you find that have UTEP licensed uh, merch, there's some really, really cool things out there. There is. There really is. But you want to know something? I, there's nothing better than watching a game in person. And now you've got the chance to do that coming out to the district, signing up, and who knows? You could be joining us tonight for UTEP and UT Permian Basin. Yeah, and we've got some tickets available. We've got actually three pairs of tickets, so if you don't have any plans here for Taco Tuesday, come on out and join us here at the district, and then maybe go catch some hoops afterward out at the Don Haskins Center. So we're taking people right up to the Countdown to Tip-Off show, 6.30 on deck, and then we'll get ready for the game. Following the game, we've got my Minor Talk presented by Jack in the Box. So a, bu- a busy week. We're here right now. It's the month of November. It's that weird time where everything kind of crosses in with each other. Football, high school football playoff. We've got college basketball that's just tipping off. NBA, NFL, everything is uh, coming in flux right now, and it's so exciting. It really is. By the way, uh, it should also, uh, you know, we should mention that with uh, UT Permian Basin coming in, based on Minor Talk Saturday, I think fans are going to want to see a completely different uh, performance than they saw here uh, on the road against Utah Valley. And I know that fans might not get answers tonight to a lot of questions they had after the terrible loss. Let's just call it what it was. Utah Valley destroyed UTEP 89-60. to And it was one of those games that left you with a really bad taste in your mouth. I felt like for the Miners in that one, they just played unlike they have really played. Uh, you know, you have to look all the way back to last year in non-conference to see the last time they played that poorly. And, you know, when you look back at some of the worst losses under this coaching staff, under uh, Joe Golding's regime, that one stacks up there, right there uh, with them. And it was just so surprising surprising to me, Steve, because I was expecting this squad to start off the season better on the road, knowing that that's what they preached all off season long. Yet, doesn't it seem like every year there's always a performance like what we saw on Saturday? Loyola Marymount is the one that comes to mind last year, where the Miners just kind of laid an egg in L.A. and just uh, didn't perform very well. So, yeah, I I would say that they hope this is just a one-off, and they hope that they can get more wins under their belt, because the road stretch is tough. It's not just, you know, next week on the road at UC Santa Barbara, but then they go to the Ball Dogs Classic to close out the month of November here uh, in Las Vegas, and then they turn the page in December, Steve. It's a tough road game against uh, Louisville on deck. So for the Miners, we'll see what happens here uh, as they continue in their non-conference schedule. You're right. And, you know, you look at what UTPB has done so far. They they squeaked out a four-point win about three days ago against Westminster University. And then they lost to Adams State, 95-88. So it's the kind of performance that makes you think that, well, UTEP should show up and they should win by 30 or 40 points. They should. Yeah, this should be a big win for them tonight. Uh, It's just like that first game that they had against Sol Ross. So, you know, when you look at this team in UT Permian Basin, there are no El Pasoans. That's the first thing that I always look for these, you know, lower level. They're not necessarily D1 level college basketball teams. Uh, I look to see if, you know, they've got any local talent. This squad does not. So, you know, I expect the Miners to go out there tonight, win by 30 plus, win by 40 plus, and go out and, you know, kind of right a little bit of the wrongs that they had last road trip against Utah Valley. I think that we'll really truly see, you know, how they really come out when they play against UC Santa Barbara. We won't really find out much tonight. No, we won't. And and the truth is also, you know, this is a Division II team. This is not a Division I team. So you look at their opponents and what they've done. Last year, they were 17-11 and 11 overall. So it, it's like, you know, when you're, when you're going up against a lower-level school, yeah, you should beat them pretty handily and, You're right. You won't get anything other than, hopefully, a little more confidence with this group. Yeah, and I want to see them, again, like they did against Sol Ross, limit turnovers, hit shots from the perimeter. I want to see this team show what they could do in distributing the ball and then seeing the different lineups. I mean, I think at some point earlier in the non-conference schedule than later in the non-conference part, they're going to have to trim down that rotation, Steve. I don't know what that really looks like. Uh, you know, 10, 11 men. I, I think you probably trim that to eight or nine when we're really talking January, February, when it counts in conference play. I think the hardest part about trimming, they don't know yet what they're going to do because other than maybe 
you know, six spots. There's probably two or three that are up for grabs, depending on how things go over the next couple of months. Yeah, that's a good point as well. I mean, I also feel like, you know, you've got great opportunities to get quality uh, wins in non-conference play, quality road wins too. So uh, for the Miners tonight, a tune-up game, uh, an opportunity to see what kind of rotation you could really throw out there. And, yeah, like you said, you know, when you go out there uh, against some conference opponents, some better opponents, you want to know who you can ride or die with on your rotation for this men's basketball squad. So maybe tonight they'll piece things together and they'll start to figure things out as far as who they like in games and who they want to keep off the floor. 505-6009 gets you right on in and through to the program. I saw this ad posted, but how about the fact that we are just 10 days away from the CUSA Volleyball Championships at Memorial Gym? That's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, it's one of those things, Steve, where you, you uh, they had hyped the UTEP Volleyball Conference Championships for so long. I feel like the uh, squad deserves a great turnout, and if you're going to mark your calendars, mark it for next weekend because that's when it really gets started for the CUSA Championships. Really does. Sebastian, have you had a chance to go to Memorial Gym and, and see the volleyball team in action yet? Disappointingly, I haven't, but it's definitely on my bucket list. And the CUSA Championships affects the whole city of El Paso, not just the UTEP Miners. It's a huge chance for tourism and a huge chance to get people knowledgeable about volleyball, to see larger turnouts in the future, and it's just going to benefit the entire city. It's on my bucket list. I'm signing up for that at the student newspaper for sure. Good. I'm excited about that. I know you've been busy. You've been traveling. You just got back from San Diego. I did. I did. The UTEP speech and debate team went over there. We were able to get second overall as a team. We came away with some hardware. Uh, over the past three days, I think I averaged 45,000 steps walking in between portables and classrooms. So to those who say that speech and debate isn't physical, I would disagree with that. But it was competitions through the uh, UTEP side of things. And it's always great to you know go out on the national side of things, show off the fact that you go to UTEP, show off the fact that you're competing at this same competition. So I like it. We got we got an intern who's who's very busy, Steve, who's uh, not just uh, so fixated on broadcast journalism. He does debate. He does uh, a lot of different things out there. Does a little bit of everything, does yeah. he? Yeah. That's right. Did you get a chance to enjoy the beach or anything in San Diego? I got a chance to eat In-N-Out Burger and buy a keychain. So nice. I didn't get the nice. entire California experience, but eating at In-N-Out twice has to acquire for 50% of it, right? Mm. Where do you rank In-N-Out compared to Whataburger? How do you do it? What do you think? Because that's, that's the number one question <laughs> that's asked for everybody around here. I think there's going to be a hashtag dislike Sebastian after I say this, but for me, I'm putting In-N-Out over Whataburger any day of the Man. week. The fries may be unsalted, but... But no one can compare to the hamburger itself. See, and, and Adrian's going to take uh, <laughs> offense to that. But yes. we've talked about that. We've had shows on this. I've said similar things, and people yes. think those are just sacrilegious words when you utter that, you know? Exactly. I mean, the fries are a simple solution. They give you salt packets. You can just put it on. But the burger patties is where we're really seeing a difference in quality. And I think in and out out versus in and out plays Whataburger any single day. Also... Animal style fries, a double double. It was less than thirteen bucks. Yeah, you felt like you <laughs> you you just won the lottery, right? Exactly, especially in California. You kidding me? That's a great price, great meal, fulfilled all my needs, especially on a day where I really needed it. You probably could have eaten for half that price in Arizona. You know that, right? That's true. That's true. But hey, at least with California, you get pretty palm trees to look at. That's true too. Uh, Alberto, where do you fall on the uh, classic uh, burger debate between those two? Um, I feel uh, I feel like Sebastian has read my mind. I think we've actually had this conversation on air, and I said literally the same exact thing after coming back from Houston where I had, it was like two burgers and, and some fries, and it was like $9.50. So as much as I love Whataburger, unfortunately, I do have to side with uh, the cheap things. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You guys are you guys are a three on one. I'm the only Whataburger guy. I feel like my Whataburger love is starting to wane too. But I I, uh, I just have to ask you this: Can you order a Buffalo Ranch chicken strip sandwich at In and Out? No, you can't <laughs> order it. any That's chicken it. strip sandwich at In and Out. That's only they only have one thing on the menu, and it's a burger. That's okay, it. I feel good about my selection. But have you there heard you of go. the Flying Dutchman? The oh, Flying no. Dutchman. No. It's like this thing where they'll give you a burger, and instead of buns, they'll give you, um, like, onions on both sides. This is that in and out Yes. Yes. That sounds Really? Disgusting. Have you done it? <laughs> I haven't had it, but it looks good. So you're telling me that 
the burger pat like the uh, the bun is replaced with onions uh yeah yeah it's like uh caramelized onions with two patties and cheese i'll send you a picture oh holy cow look at that wow not for me not for me would you do that my dad has tried it a friend wanted to try it. I would eat it. Uh, the first time we went to In-N-Out, I got two protein-style burgers because I wasn't feeling the bread. So I would definitely try it. But back to what Adrian was saying about a chicken strip sandwich. If you're going to a burger place, what are you ordering chicken for? <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. I why, want why, versatility. Is I want that the what versatility. It is? You don't want to just eat the burger every time. I just want different choices. Give me, give me a couple different choices. I, I'm going to go with the patty. I'll go with the, uh, you know, traditional burger. Yeah. But uh, I'll go with the side things. Um, you know, uh, every other time. Well, here's the good news. We don't have In and Out here today, but we've got Taco Tuesday, and that right there is worth the price of admission alone. Taco Tuesday with dollar fifty hard and soft shell tacos out here at the District West. Plus two fifty Tecate, Tecate lights and three fifty Ornitos. So come on down and join us. We'll be with you till six thirty. As we mentioned, Bernie's gonna be by. We got a ton to talk about on the show today. The awards continue to pile in for Skylar Lockler off of a career best. We'll get to that and a whole lot more right after Charlie One, who has this traffic update for us. I I finally feel good. I know that even though I just picked these games, I could go 0-10 next hour and still come out on top. That is a that's a good feeling, guys. That is a good feeling this year. Oh, uh, you're on an island. I'm gonna I have a terrible feeling because I only have a one score lead against Bernie Olivas. And I have I'm in jeopardy of going three in a row, Steve. Three years in a row where I'm the bottom feeder. I, I think I should be voted off the island. I think that's how it, it should work. If I lose three years in a row, I picked 58% of my games right. Bernie picked 57% of his games right so far. You're at 70%. Wow. All right, by the way, let me say this. Because I started gaining a lead, you guys have both tried to take chances, and that for yours truly. I feel good. Well, you could have done like what we did or just picked with us, so then you could have been the safe. But you wanted your record to look good, and right now, I think we, I mean, I have to go back and do some of the records and see what, what uh, we did last year, but oh, I historical. think you're on pace. Yeah, I think you're on pace for maybe the best record um, that we've seen on this side. I haven't seen anybody have 76. I think last year we were close uh, to, like, you know, maybe 71, 72, and it was all said and done. But you're already 76, and we have one more week left. Good. I feel good. I do. Um, so, uh, Bernie joining us with a special guest uh, picker this week. By the way, you hear the breeze in the background. It's because we have a nice, delightful breeze out here at the District West, 3233 North Mesa. Come down, and if you want to go to tonight's basketball game, we can look at sending you there. We've got great prizes, too. Adrian has really done a terrific job with uh, his uh, Oscar Adietta sponsorship to bring us some great stuff. We've got the 915 white hat. We've got the Texas Western orange uh, hat. We've got the Win the West t-shirts. We've got a great-looking uh, UTEP uh, sweatshirt that could probably come into handy later tonight. You want to win all that, all you got to do is join us out here at the District West. It's simple. Yeah, just stop by, say hi. We'll hook you up with some great prizes and some giveaways, and uh, you can celebrate for some Taco Tuesday ahead of some UTEP basketball here, tipping off at 7 o'clock. Appreciate Chris Banks telling us that we've got to try P. Terry's in Austin. He says it's like a blend of In-N-Out and Whataburger. And by the way, Chris, I think we're going to be heading to Austin next year for the UTEP Texas game in football. So that might be on our on our hit list of places Ooh. to go while we hit Austin. Yeah, I love Austin. By the way, I got to hit up P. Terry's. I've had uh, my family loves P. Terry's. They've definitely shouted that place out before. So uh, good plug right there. I wish you know what I was thinking. Like, could we ever get a P. Terry's over here in El Paso? I don't know if we're ever going to get a in and out the pace that we're going, but maybe we get a P. Terry's down the line. Well. If, if that is true and somebody's kind of taken the best of both worlds between those two places and turned it into one, that'll be a lot of fun. Nice. Yeah, I, w I agree completely. I'm looking at their locations. Uh, it There are a lot of locations, but, yeah, Central Texas mostly, Steve. San Antonio as well. Okay. Well, you know what? We'll look to hit that in, in, in Austin. Appreciate the tip on that from Chris and, and giving us the lowdown. By the way, the um, accolades continue to pour in for UTEP football, specifically uh, Skylar Lockler on the offensive side of the ball and Corey Chapman on the defensive side of the ball. They had great games, and I didn't get a chance to talk about this yesterday because 
I wasn't on the air with you guys, but look, you have a 1-8 team against a 1-7 team. That means it's going to be a really good football game, which is exactly what it turned into. And you know what? Give UTEP credit. I thought that they weren't going to finish because of their kicking game, which is probably the biggest weak spot on this team after all these weeks right now, you could say. But Skylar Locklear uh, played the best game that any quarterback has played this year. And you could even go back and say the last few years, he really was terrific for the Miners. Don't you feel like funny, different sides of the spectrum, like really awful about certain moments of that game, but really good about other moments, Steve? Like, I could pinpoint five different times where I think the Miners should have won that game in regulation, not just double overtime, the regular other times where they could have lost the game, you know, when it was all said and done. So it just went both ways. It was a very emotional game on both sides, felt let, like. Let me say this, though, because I didn't talk about this uh, until now. You know, I've watched this team get in the red zone all year and most often settle for either missed field goals, field goals, or, you know, if they were lucky, a touchdown. But they've also come up empty a bunch. And finally on Saturday, I saw this team throw the ball in the end zone, which is something that, for whatever reason, they don't like to do. But they did it on Saturday, and I kept saying, you know what? Great things happen if you actually throw the ball into the end zone. Because if it's caught, it's a touchdown. You don't have to catch the ball on the, uh, you know, the sidelines and hope to run the ball in eight to seven or eight yards, or get a handoff and hope to break a hole and get into the end zone. I just wish that they would look at that game against Kennesaw State and realize that when they are inside the the twenty yard line, take a shot or two. Because good things happen when you throw the ball in the end zone. Yeah, think about that final touchdown right to Kenny Odom that's uh, on the, you know, in the kind of corner of the end zone. Just a, a great pass by Skylar Lockyer, but I thought it was an aggressive play call. And to your point, Steve, I agree. I mean, they've got to go out throwing the ball a little bit more. I think the run game at times becomes predictable, and it should not be something they rely on. It should be something that complements their whole high-power offense. However that looks, if the run game is going, we'll keep feeding that. If the passing game is working – which it was Saturday. I mean, I think at one point Skyler Locklear was like 12 of 14 through the air. He was as efficient as it got uh, in that game. And then he finishes off with four touchdown passes, no interceptions in that entire game. I think the two Odom touchdowns were both thrown in the end zone, were they not? Yes, that's right. And I think also the Marcus Vincent touchdown was. was thrown in the end zone. So three of the four touchdown passes were all thrown in the end zone, which is something, again, you just don't see a lot of on this team. No, the passing routes, you'll sometimes see a screen that sets the runner up to try to get into the end zone, but actually throwing it to the end zone, that's something we haven't really seen. And I get it. Look, you had J.P. Pickles against Middle Tennessee in the recent home game, but they just looked more explosive against Kennesaw State. Maybe it's a product of those corners really struggling with the Owls. Look, with Kennesaw State, they fired their coach, who basically built that program did. Uh, You know, right after the loss to UTEP. So they've got some things to figure out over at Kennesaw State. For the Miners, I think they're are just going to take any form of excitement, any form of winning, and uh, run with it and, you know, cherish those moments. I think, if I'm not mistaken, that coach started the program. He's been their only head coach since their inception. Yeah, I think it's like a 10-year uh, run that he was their coach. Yep. You're right, Steve. And then he ends up building that program up. He obviously sees, sees the transition from FCS to FBS. Uh, but then is, you know, relieved of his duties, decides to step down, whatever you want to say. We all know how those conversations go behind closed doors. Well, look, he's had a he's been on a downward trend the last three seasons. And now that they're in Division One FBS, you can't afford that. You have to be taking your program on the upswing. And even though he had his share of ups, like, I forget the record. They're like nine and twenty-seven the last three years. Yeah, because one of the things you could say about Casey Keeler with Sam Houston when they transitioned from FCS to FBS is he won. He won at the FCS level, and he's proven right now that even though they struggled last year, they're winning this year. And you look at a coach like uh, Rich Rod over at Jacksonville State. He watched as they transitioned from FCS to FBS, 
albeit they didn't qualify, quote unquote, for a bowl game last year. They end up getting the waiver approved and then go uh, get qualified to play in that bowl game last year. So sometimes it works out, but the biggest thing is you have to be committed. When you make that jump from FCS to FBS, you have to be committed to wi- a winning program. And I think that's what Kennesaw State showed right there is that they want to they want to win. It, yep. You know, they don't want to just be the laughing stock of CUSA. We are at the bottom of the hour. Normally, uh, Sebastian will deliver Sports Center, but he is on location. Are you able to still wing it with Sports Center from your phone? We can do it, Steve. It's ready to go. I love it. I can tell because I'm watching you and I can see that you're on your phone and you're on standby. You're just waiting for the signal. So right now, why don't you take us through, Sebastian, with this bottom of the hour live on location Sports Center update. Thank you, Steve. Let's get to the headlines. Shane Waldron has been fired as the Bears' offensive coordinator. Shane Waldron has been relieved of his duties less than 10 months after being hired for the job. The Bears announced the firing today, one day right after head coach Matt Eberflus promised changes and adjustments for the struggling Bears' passing game. The passing game coordinator, Thomas Brown, has been promoted to the offensive coordinator. After evaluating our entire operation, I decided decided that it is in the best interest of our team to move in a different direction with the leadership on our offense, said Eberflus. Moving on to college football, the University of Southern California has been fined and put on probation for 2022 and 2023 coaching violations. The USC football program has been fined a total of $50,000 and placed on a one-year probation due to a violation of on- and off-field coaching activities said the NCAA just today. Eight analysts for the football program engaged in on- and off-field coaching activities during spring of 2022, fall of 2022, and spring of 23, resulting in football programs exceeding the permissible number of countable coaches by six for two academic years, the NCAA said in its release. As a result of the violations, the parties have also agreed that football head coach Lincoln Riley violated head coaching responsibility rules. However, the NCAA said that because of some violations occurred before the rule changes in January of 23. The shifted head coach responsibilities from a rebuttal presumption to an automatic attachment. Riley will not be suspended. And finally, ending off with Major League Baseball. The Rays hurricane damage home can be fixed for $55 million, but it'll be ready for 2026. That's your Sports Center update. I'm Sebastian Perez Navarro. Great job as always, Sebastian. Excellent work. We appreciate that as we welcome you back to the show. 34 now past the hour as we continue here on Sports Talk. 505-6009, that is our telephone number, 505-6009. Uh, get you right on in and through to the program. We'll love to hear from you with uh, Alberto Odueta handling the uh, show back at 600 ESPN El Paso in our River Oaks property, Schoolyard Sports Studios. Um, you know, the Miners are now 2-8. and eight. They have the, They're off, deservingly so. Then they get Tennessee, which we all know that's going to be a rough, rough game before they wrap things up with their final home game. I'm sorry, their final game against New Mexico State. Could be a home game depending on how many El Pasoans show up. By the way, Shea Smith has now played in all four games. So you wonder, is he like the emergency third quarterback for the last two weeks? Because you don't want to take him out of his red shirt season. You don't want to burn that if you're Utah. Yeah, I'm kind of smiling here, Steve, because now I feel like this coaching staff has actually staggered this perfectly if they don't want to play Shea Smith anymore. And if you're looking at using J.P. Pickles as the backup for the last two games, I'll explain why. Pickles has only played two games so far. He could technically still get his red shirt regardless. He could play both these games, no problem at all, and be a red shirt freshman next year coming back. Shea Smith, on the other hand, he's already played his four games, so he can't play anymore. So if you see him against uh, Tennessee on the road, if you see him in that New Mexico State game, then he burns this year of eligibility and yep. he'll return next year as a sophomore. Somebody pointed this out to me, and I, I totally agree with that. It doesn't mean that they can't redshirt next year. So That's Shea true. Smith could always come back next year as a true so- sophomore and then always redshirt next year. However, those things don't typically happen. You don't really see that kind of thing happen. You'll see it as a freshman. They they want a redshirt of freshman out there. Listen, knowing Paul Smith, there is absolutely zero chance 
He wants his son, who's played in four games as a true freshman, to get redshirted his sophomore year. No way for that. Much better opportunity to redshirt these last two games, so at least he has four more years to play. Yeah, that's a good point because, you know, when you talk about Chase Smith, the biggest thing that you want from him is the development. He's still not a finished product whatsoever. You like the uh, physical traits that he brings. The play that he joined in with UTEP that you mentioned, he scored a touchdown on, his first career touchdown with the Miners. He gave that touchdown ball to his dad. Uh, he showed that on social media. He's He's been celebrated in a big way for being one of the hometown players on this that's team right. who's uh, kind of, you know, you know, embracing that role right there and for Shay Smith next year I don't know what his role really looks like is he like the backup role for a Skylar Locklear to return next year or does he uh, feel confident in just being maybe a second or third stringer next year as you could tell from this year you can't take any of these quarterbacks for granted because injuries happen and you know it's it's uh, no excuse next year you got to get ready and you got to be ready to play if you're a backup quarterback for this squad you, you do you do and by the way I mean knowing that Kate McConnell is planning a uh, comeback for next season and, and getting a chance to try to uh, come back here as a senior and, and win back the job. And then Skyler and JP and possibly Shea. You could have the exact same quarterback room as you had this this season next year. Yeah, you'll add Chad Warner to that mix, too, because he was the true freshman who visited this weekend. He's out of the San Antonio area, and he also he's somebody who um, it, a lot of fans really like, three-star quarterback, could come in next year as a true freshman, and I don't think he necessarily plays, but then you have that comfort to know you could redshirt him, let him develop in the system, and run it back with the same quarterback room that you had this past year, knowing that McConnell could come back, Smith could come back. Pickles could come back. Same with Locklear. He could come back as well. All right. 38 past the hour. 505-6009. That is our telephone number as we continue here at uh, the District West. Sun is starting to set in about an hour or so. By the way, I don't know if you noticed. Well, you probably could have seen this because you were live last night on location. Last night on the west side of town, one of the most beautiful sunsets we've ever seen was last night gorgeous outside. oh man you know they opened up the windows at border city alehouse last night steve we got a chance to see a little bit of that sunset it was beautiful last night yes really was and you know what else is beautiful taco tuesday all the great specials out here all the great prizes we're giving away just for stopping by and saying hi come on down make the district west your place before and after every utep game 3233 North Mesa. It's a district pub and kitchen. Hanging with you on a UTEP Hoops Tuesday. We'll come back 7 past the hour as we continue here on Sports Talk. Coming your way on the patio at the district pub and kitchen west. Welcome back, everybody. Along with uh, Adrian Bratis, we also have Sebastian Perez Nevado and Alberto Dueta back at the district pub and kitchen. I'm Steve Kaplow. It's a lot going on out here at the district. Yeah, see, there's a really, you know, there's so much going on here, and it is dollar fifty taco night. That's right, it's Taco Tuesday here at the district. We are celebrating thanks to all their happy hour specials going on till six o'clock, and then we've got great specials as well. Talk about the three fifty hornitos out here at the district, and it's all here Taco Tuesday. You can get it soft shell, hard shell, however you're looking for it, and uh, also take advantage of the two fifty tecate and tecate light all here at the district west 3233 north mesa come on down and join us here for sports talk we've got great prizes here thanks to the oscar at the agency we got free sunglasses free giveaways that you can take away from here we also have some excellent hats we have a sweatshirt here from utep and we even have a utep uh t-shirt as well thanks to the oscar at the agency come on down register for free and uh, you can take home some of these prizes we also have tickets to the utep basketball taking on utpb matchup here tonight so we could you can stop by say hi take advantage of some of these great prizes that were given away all the way up till 6 30 right here on 600 espn el paso here out at the district ahead of utep men's basketball a lot of good stuff guys a lot of good stuff as we keep things moving out here on a uh, utep basketball tuesday which by the minors for the first time uh, for the next three weeks because they're not going to be back here till early December. So yeah. this is definitely the night you got to come because after this, they've got some neutral site games, some road games, some tournament games, but they're not going to be back here till like, what, December 7th? 
Yeah, they're not going to be back till December 7th here at the Don Haskins Center, so this is the time to take advantage. Uh, the next time you'll see UTEP, it's Seattle. So for some, it might be a little worrisome, right, because UTEP has a, a gauntlet of a road stretch to close out the road, uh, or excuse me, the month of November. It's taking on UC Santa Barbara next Wednesday, and then they go on the road to Vegas for that Ball Dogs Classic. So you want to see the Miners stack up some wins before the next time you see them out here at the Don Haskins Center. Yeah. I mean, we're talking, God, <laughs> December 7th, we're days. Exactly. That's three and a half weeks. That's three crazy. and a half weeks, Bernie. Three and a half weeks, a long time. Man, look at Bernie yeah. Olivas. He looks great. He's got the winter uh, quarter zip of the Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl. I love it. He's, you know, the Sun Bowl merch is always my favorite. Hands it is. Down. It is. And, and by the way, as he said, the best logo in the bowl business. So... You know, that's and, and Bernie's going to need that quarter zip to try to get him past you uh, this <laughs> this final week of the picks. That's it. You know what? I might have to sell a couple of those quarter zips to pay for a you know a Chick Fil A um, you know lunch if I don't win this week, Steve. I only have a one point lead, like we discussed earlier, over Bernie Olivas. And if uh, I don't come through big this this week, then uh, I could be paying for Chick Fil A three years in a row. You know, what we have to have to figure out is. Are we picking championship week two, or is this is this week going to be our final week of the contest? Is this the final week, Bernie? Is it, are we are we doing championship week as well? well of course, we're going to have a show. Oh, look at uh, this! This is we'll not your last of, week. Thank you. So this is not the last week. You have, there's two weeks left to go. That's huge. That's huge stuff. So it does not go down to the wire. It does not go down to the wire. For You've me. given you you know you have a lifeline. You yes. have a, you have a chance to pad your lead on Bernie. <laughs> yes, and that's what I'm hoping for this week for sure. No doubt about it. All right. So we'll talk more about that ten minutes from now when we get ready for the Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl watch. In the meantime. Let's go to Jorge, who's joining us to talk a little UTEP hoops, UTEP football as well, listening on the 600 ESPN El Paso app. Jorge, how are you today? I'm doing great. I was actually in San Antonio, and I was able to switch over from, from on my ESPN app from watching the basketball game to watching the football game. I was a little disappointed in the Utah Valley loss against the yeah, well, the Utah Valley loss, I didn't really get to see the whole scuffle, but I, I saw some of it when the players were being ejected. Uh, it, it just, it, their, this squad reminds me of last year's squad a little bit, where they come a little, uh, they, they were a little out of focus, I, I want to say. Yeah. To say the least, I mean, they weren't as intense as they were the first, the first game, but I mean, that's to be expected. I mean, they, they're gonna, they're gonna gel at their own time. Uh, the, the, the football, the football team did an amazing job. I, I was cheering. I was, I was at a dinner, see, for my aunt, uh, uh, UTEP Zay's aunt. Uh, we were up there and, uh, and, uh, I was kind of, to put it lightly, I was like a wild man. I, I went crazy. Yeah. That, that, uh, that, that finish was incredible. Well, let me say this, George, a couple of things. First off, I think the word you're looking for to describe the basketball team on Saturday was soft. Because to me, they played soft. They did not play with the kind of intensity you wanted to see outside of that scuffle, which, by the way, nobody should have been tossed. To me, the only guys that should have been tossed were the players that left the bench from Utah Valley because by the rules, if you leave the bench to join something like this, you're automatically out. Those guys should have been tossed. But the, the uh, players from UTEP and also Utah Valley that were, that were ejected, uh, that, that's a joke. To me, the referees went above where they should have gone in terms of the punishment for that. Um, as far as, you know, the, uh, you know the, the football team, they played great. Basketball-wise, yeah, I can see there was some concern. It was some concern on minor talk after the game, and I understand that. But you know what? I told this to Adrian earlier, and it's a good point. Basketball, for whatever reason, always seems to have a performance like this early on in the year. Valley is not Duke. They're not a top team that you're expecting. They're not Louisville. So that's the kind of team you would expect this performance against 
not against the Utah Valley. That's the only thing. Right, and and so going going alongside, uh, and then yesterday Dallas. I mean Sunday Dallas, the loss and thirty four six. That's just an embarrassment. I mean that just goes to show uh, when you don't make any any moves during the off season, those are the things that are going to happen to your team. And as far as I, I never got a chance to tell you about the World Series, but go Dodgers! My Dodgers did it, and they did it in stunning did. fashion in New they York. They did. God, it would it would suck to be a Yankees fan right now. You know, you're that close, done against the Dodgers. I can't even imagine what they're going through right now and how tough it is for them. But Dodger fans should be loving life. I mean, that's hey to win it in Game Five the way you did in the fifth inning. That right there. Yeah. Was this story? That was the story of the series for me. So, yep, really was. Well, George, great job, man. Thanks for calling in today. We appreciate it. Well, thank All you, right. and I just want to say thank you for everything you guys do. Oh, we appreciate that, George. Thanks for listening, and as always, thank you for UTEP Zay. That's a hey, that's a thank you we can throw your way. So we appreciate that too. All right, one down, ninety to go. When we come back, Bernie Olivas is going to be here from the Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl Watch. And he's got a special guest picker as well. We'll do that coming back here at the District Live, 3233 North Mesa with 600 ESPN El Paso. From the 600 ESPN El Paso River Oaks Property Schoolyard Sports Studio, here's Steve Kaplowitz and Adrian Broadus. Friend of the program, Jim Ward. His great uh, music gets us started to begin hour two here live on location it's the District Pub and Kitchen West, 32-33 North Mesa. Come down and watch some action. That's right, action. We've got Central Michigan, the Chips, who were uh, in the Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl back in uh, COVID, for those uh, that follow that game. I think it was the 2021, right? That was the uh, year after COVID. They're playing Toledo right now. Hey, by the way, something's wrong with this game. There's no snow on the field right now, Adrian. We're not seeing, you know, 25-degree <laughs> weather in, Mich- in uh, Toledo. Yeah, the only thing that we will see, fast forward, is craziness. You know that, like, this game is going to be something like 39-25, and then somehow the team who's down is going to come back and rally back and win in triple overtime. So yep. that's all you can definitely uh, confirm in action. All sorts of craziness happens for these weeknight games. So true. So, so true. Hey, by the way, We've got uh, our own Maction here at the District West with Taco Tuesday. $1. fifty hard and soft shell tacos. Two fifty Tecate and Tecate lights. Not to mention three fifty Ornitos. So come down. Check it out. 3233 North Mesa Suite 103 with the District West and Sports Talk Live. All right. We do it every Tuesday throughout the football season. It's the Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl Watch. Back with us for another big week is Bernie Olivas, Executive Director of the Sun Bowl Association. As we are now 16 days away from the Glasheen Valles Inderman Sun Bowl Thanksgiving Parade right around the corner. Bernie, I'm just happy you could take a break from building those floats and joining us here on the show. It's going to be an exciting Thanksgiving Day parade, let me tell you. It's, uh, working hard there. I've seen some of the floats, and they are fantastic. So come on out here, free of charge, 10 o'clock from Ochoa on Montana all the way to Copia. And if you don't want to stand on the curb or sit on the curb, you can pick up a grandstand ticket at any Vista location for $10, and you get you know you get your own parking, and you get everything else. And like I said, you get to see it, see it from us sitting, from sitting down. So... Go to Vista Markets, pick up your beats at any Vista location in El Paso. And we're a little more than a month away from the West Star, Don Haskins, Sun Bowl invitation. We are going, like I said, we're, we're, we're stepping that up with everything. I said we're going to have some special entertainment this year. You know about it. We'll talk about it a little bit later when time gets close. But uh, we're looking forward to that. I think, uh, you know, I talked to Coach Golding. He says, hey, you put a pr- pretty good uh, field together this year with Yale. And uh, Jackson State, and of course uh, uh, Akron. Akron. So we're uh, we're looking forward to that to that uh, tournament. And uh, go, come on, and get it. Come, come on and catch support the miners. You're right. All right. Before we get to what I give thanks for every week, the Chick Fil A Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl Selectum Contest. Let's talk about the standings. And and are we getting more clarity 
for our game here in El Paso since we are just weeks away from really the big one, which is championship week, decision time, and finding out who's going to play in this game. No, it's actually getting worse every week. There are more possible teams that can play in the Tony and Tiger Sumble this week than they were last week. From the ACC, we can probably exclude SMU. You know, they're 8-1. and one. Clemson is 7-2, and two, and Miami is 9-1. and one. You can probably exclude them from being in the Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl. However, Louisville, Pittsburgh, who was undefeated just a couple of weeks ago, can fall into our picture now. Georgia Tech is already bowl eligible. Syracuse, Duke, Virginia, Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech needs one win. Boston College needs one win. And North Carolina needs one win. All those teams are possibles here at the Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl. Let's add to that list. North Carolina State needs one win. That's right. NC State. I forgot about NC State and Cal. Yep. As a matter of fact, I will go see the Cal-Syracuse uh, game this week, this weekend up in up in Berkeley. Uh, looking forward to seeing that game. Like I said, either one of those teams could possibly make it down here. And by the way, if Cal comes, it would be pretty uh, significant because they've never been to El Paso to play this game. There are two Pac-12 teams that have never played in the Sun Bowl. Cal is one of them, and the other one is Colorado. And for a while, we thought maybe we shot it, we had a shot at Colorado, but uh, them beating Texas Tech, I think uh, somebody above us will take them. How about the Pac-12? How does that look with all the teams from around the, the, the world of college football? Yeah, the Pac-12 is just as bad as far as collections. You know, I think we can rule out Oregon. We can probably rule out Washington State and Colorado. I mean, somebody above us is going to take them. I think or Oregon will probably will definitely make it into the uh, into the playoffs. But after that, you know, Arizona State could be a possible here. Uh, Cal, I'm going to go see Cal. They need one win. Washington, they need one win. UCLA needs a couple of wins, but they got a couple of winnable games. Oregon State, they'll be, they may become bowl eligible, but we will not take them because they were here last year. And, of course, USC needs a couple of wins. they got to win two out of their last three games. I would say they have to win their next two games because their last game against Notre Dame. Uh, so, but they need to, you know, they, they get Nebraska this weekend, and then they get the, the big old UCLA game the following week. And, of course, Utah was going to be, was, you know, they lost rising, and ever since then they've been going kind of coming downhill. But, again, they're only two wins away from being bowl eligible. So there are still a lot of schools that are possible here at Tony Tiger Sun Bowl. And I'll, I'll list Notre Dame since they're part of the ACC Pac-12, uh, ACC, uh, you know, bowl selection. They're not going to be at El Paso this year. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen such a wide-open field this late in the college football season. Oh, I blame it on on the portal transfer, on the on the transfer portal. Yeah, I think you know so many players are are moving and making you know teams weaker and other teams stronger, and the parity is 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 unbelievable this year. Anybody can beat anybody every you know this year. So uh it's kind of exciting but at the same time we have no clue as to who's going to be here in a couple of weeks i just saw I mean, that weeks. you know usc was put on probation for coaching violations does right. that that has nothing to do with a bowl game correct no, not at all i think they had too many coaches too many coaches on the sideline for a couple of games but uh, uh nothing's happening nobody gets them suspended or anything else okay it was just a coaching they just had too many coaches on the sideline so we're wide open with the game we're also wide open with our Chick-fil-A Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl Selective Contest because after last week, Bernie, uh, you picked seven right. I picked seven right. Adrian picked six right. So, Adrian, where do we stand right now in the contest after 11 weeks? So after 11 weeks, Steve, you have a firm lead, 76 points. I'm right behind you, not right behind you. It's a bit of a gap. 64 points on second place. And Bernie... You have 63. Hey, you saw what happened last year. You saw, you remember what happened last year. You are not <laughs> coming back to win this thing under any circumstances. <laughs> You're not making up a 13-game deficit in two weeks. I'm sorry. As much as I love you and as much as I think you are a terrific prognosticator when it comes to this stuff, uh, you've got other things to worry about, hey, which is what? right I... now trying to get out of the cellar and, and pass Adrian with uh, two weeks to go. You know, I can lose the popular vote, but come out with the electoral vote and come by and pass you up some out. There you go. There you <laughs> Spoken go. like a true politician, <laughs> right? That is exactly. And you brought a good one picking Absol- against you this week. Absolutely, we brought a good one. 
long time coming. Tim Haggerty, the only radio voice of the El Paso Chihuahuas since their inception here to El Paso, the host of Storytime, and now guest picker in Chick-fil-A, Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl Selectum Contest Week 12. Welcome back to the show. Can I just tell you guys, I got a phone call this morning from Bernie, and he said, hey, Tim, this is Bernie Olivas with the Sun Bowl, Angela's dad. I know who you are, Bernie. I've been here 11 years. Hey, you know, Everybody knows you. Anyway, you know, I just want to make sure there was no imposter. There wasn't an imposter call. It's not 2014, all. Bernie. I love it. By the way, great job lining somebody up the morning of the contest. I like that better. I was expecting something from Hags to say, you know, I got a call here 10 hours ago and you know Three what? Weeks we, we ago. Our, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no. or, or a month ago, we made this work. No, the morning of. I like that, Bernie. Tim has been on our list for three years, and I don't know why we've never had him until now. Well, you but got. We're glad. I'm to ready. Have him. We're glad to have him. Tim, are you becoming more of a football fan as your son gets older? Yes, uh, I've always loved watching football. Certainly, though, my son, who's now eight, who's getting into football, he plays in a flag football team. That's enhanced my knowledge of rosters. Um, so, yeah, I would say I'm a casual football fan. I enjoy going to UTEP games. I've been to football games this year. I've been to a couple at UTEP and one at NMSU. Um, but, you know, if this segment was one hour long, you'd probably see me exposed. I, I can maybe fool you guys for ten minutes. Okay. What's the biggest change you've noticed in football uh, from when you used to watch to now? You know the thing? Maybe you guys can enlighten me on this but on kickoffs the alignments are so different in the nfl now that's taking some getting used to for me that was actually from the xfl that's where they got that from it's the idea is to try to reduce all of the collisions that'll happen when you take off and run full speed on on a normal kickoff right that's interesting yeah my my wife's from washington so a couple of weeks from now my son's going to go to his first nfl game we're going to seahawks home game look forward to that i've never been that'll be a lot of fun What's it like having to spend money for tickets, mm. knowing you never do that in all the years you've worked in minor league baseball? That there's there's one given, it's that, hey, you've got enough baseball connections to know you're taken care of. How about this? It was a, a hit to the wallet. Um, I had not purchased NFL tickets in a long time. I was a little bit surprised how expensive they were. So we'll be getting there early. We'll be getting our money's worth. And I don't care if it's 30 degrees and pouring rain. We're staying until the end. I don't care if it's 52 to 7. There you go. We're not leaving. <laughs> no. That's my top I like game. The That's my top way to do. You're getting your money's worth yes. and then some. Exactly. Good. Okay. We've got games to pick. We also have trivia to play to give away a pair of tickets to the Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl. Bernie, how about throwing that question out there? Oh, we'll start with a question. I think it's a good question this year, this year, and it's not going to be as difficult as I wanted it to be. So the question for two tickets to the Tony Tiger Sun Bowl game, how many head coaches have coached in Sun Bowl and have gone on to win national championships at the FBS level? How many former Sun Bowl coaches have gone on to win national championships at the FBS college level? That should be not a even, tough question. Not even going to ask you who they were. Just how many, and you'll be surprised. Oh, wait a minute. So all you need is a number? You don't even have to identify them? No, there's too many to identify. Wow. All right, I love that. First person through with the correct answer wins. 505-6009 gets you through. Week 12 coming up next, right after Charlie won with his traffic update. District Pub and Kitchen West, 3233 North Mesa. Hanging with you in the Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl watch. Alberto, do we have a winner yet on trivia? We do, we do, we do. It took about, I want to say, six or seven callers, but sure enough, on the seventh caller, David Castle, we call him Castle apparently. He secured the win. 12 was Good. the answer. 12. And I think that would be David Castle's first win this season. He's won in the past. I know that. Congratulations, David. Let's get that list before we get started with our picks here. You Bernie. got it. And the question was how many head coaches who coached at the Sun Bowl have won national championships at the FBS college level. And they are Jim Harbaugh with Stanford. 
Barry Switzer with Oklahoma. Bob Stoops with Oklahoma. Bob Devaney with Nebraska. Mac Brown with Texas. Vince Dooley with Georgia. Johnny Majors with Pitt. Don James with Washington. Nick Saban, coach here with Michigan State. Tom Osborne with Nebraska. Johnny Vaught with Old Miss. And Bobby Ross with Georgia Tech. It's a good list. That is how many national championship coaches have coached in the Sun Bowl. And we know we've had four Heisman Trophy winners, and I've always wanted to know what this list was, so we looked it up, and there was been 12. So that's pretty cool. It's a great question. shows the kind of talent we get here at the Sun Bowl. So great, great question. Buy your tickets now. Oh, I love it. All right. Nicely done. Let's uh, go ahead and uh, start our picks with celebrity picker, the great Tim Haggerty, who's really going to take us to school because now that he's following football, I want to learn from Tim. So here's how this works. Hags, well, I'll give you the games, the records, the uh, point spreads, just for information purposes only. And all we need from you is the team to win. So we'll start with UCLA in Washington, Friday night, 7 o'clock. UCLA is 4-5, and 3-4 and four in the Big Ten. Washington's 5-5. Five and five. Also, 3-4 and four in the Big Ten. The game will be played at Husky Stadium in Seattle. Washington, a 3.5-point favorite. Tim, who do we like? Kick it off the segment. Yeah, in my lunchtime cramming, I found this to be the hardest game to pick out of the 10. Washington's got one more win, plus they're at home, so I'm going with the Huskies. All right, Huskies for Hags. What about you, Bert? I'm going with the Huskies as well. Uh, I was going to go to that game today, but we switched, uh, changed our mind, and decided to go over to Cal. Okay. That's That's an important game for us. It is. They're both important, but I get it with Cal. All right, two for Washington. What about you, Adrian? I'm going to UCLA. I picked oh. it before we talked. Uh, I liked how the Bruins have been playing as of late. Give me the road UCLA squad in this matchup. All right. <laughs> and I'm going with Washington. So I'll stay with uh, the Huskies at home, and uh, we'll see how that game ends up. So good start. That'll take us to game number two. Game number two is going to feature number 23, Clemson, 7-2, and 6-1 and one in the ACC, Visiting 7-2 and two Pitt. They're 3-2 and two in the ACC. They're 18th in the country. Uh, this game will be uh, in Pitt at Akershire Stadium. But Clemson Birdie, 10-point road favorites. You know, Pitt's lost two in a row. You know, they start off to a great season. They, uh, they've they lost their last two. I think they're going to get off the snide right here. I'm picking Pittsburgh over Clemson this weekend. Ah, big pick there. Adrian, your turn. I did the same thing. I'm taking Pitt in this matchup right here. Uh, I love how they've been playing as late. I know Clemson is still one of the top teams you're going to find the ACC, but I, I like the upset here. A bit of an upset in taking Pitt at home. I will go Clemson and Cade Klubnik, who I absolutely love. Uh, they got Moffat running back. They got a loaded team, a loaded offense. I think they go and win on the road. They are 10-point favorites, so if Pitt wins, it would be an upset. Hags, who do you like? I'm picking Road Clemson. As Bernie noted, Pittsburgh's had a rough few weeks. Okay. Mm -hmm. They have. That gets us right back to it. Let's jump back over to uh, a game in the Big 12 featuring 4 and 5 Utah visiting number 20 Colorado. The Buffs, 7 and 2, 5 and 1 in the Big 12. Utah, 4 and 5, 1 and 5 in the Big 12. Colorado, uh, Adrian. 10-point home favorites at Folsom Field in Boulder. I've never wavered from this Colorado team all season long. I won't waver from them this week nor next week. I love this team. I love Shador. I love Travis Hunter. Give me Colorado at home. No question. Yep, I'm with you. I'll take the Buffaloes as well. Hags, your turn. Can we talk about Coach Prime? Guys, uh, when I was a kid, I used to tell people that I didn't like Deion Sanders, the way he danced, the way he height-stepped. But the truth is, I was lying. I've always liked him. I liked him on CBS as an NFL analyst. He had 500 hits in the big leagues. I'm going with Coach Prime in Colorado. Ooh, a little baseball there. I like it. I like that, too. All right, uh, Bernie, your turn. You know, I've been kind of hoping that Colorado would be losing because we, we would have a shot at them. But I think uh, they've turned a the corner. I think they're going to be above us. So I'm switching, and I am taking the buffs this week. So we're unanimous. We all go Colorado at home over Utah. All right. Let's go now to game number four. It's going to feature 
The aforementioned Cal Golden Bears at 5-4, and 1-4 and four in the ACC, hosting 6-3 and three Syracuse. The Cuse, 3-3 three and three in the ACC. Game is in Berkeley at Cal Memorial Stadium, California. Eight and a half point favorites. Guys, I think it's a high spread. I really do think Syracuse can keep this game close. However, cross-country trip, never like that when you have to travel from upstate New York all the way over to California and go over there to Berkeley. Therefore, I will take the Bell Golden Bears. I think they become bowl eligible, and they beat Syracuse to secure the win. Hags, what about you? Yeah, Cal's won two games in a row. They're at home. I agree with you. Let's go with them. All right, Bernie. I agree with both of you because I think going across from, from New York all the way to California to play a game is pretty tough. I think it's going to be pretty tough. And, you know, Cal is 5-4, and four and they win, and I don't know if people realize it is possible for the Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl to have two ACC teams playing in the game. Yes, it is. With, you know, with Cal out there, uh, if somebody else is out there who they have not played during the season, we could possibly get two ACC. Yeah, it would be kind of wild. Yeah, absolutely. But I'm, I'm taking Cal in this game. All right. Adrian, your turn. I love Kyle McCord, and I like the Syracuse team. Um, you know, I know that it's a tough road trip, but I think McCord is tougher, so give me Syracuse on the road. Wow. Yeah. All right. You're working really hard. I'm winning right this now. week. I'm winning this week. You are working hard to <laughs> blow that lead you've no. got over Bernie. Oh, my God. God, I could be I could be uh, like everybody else to just pick Cal. No problem at all. I'm a risk taker, Steve. I told Adrian before the segment started. I said, pick every game Bernie picks. <laughs> Keep your one game lead, and you're and you're all safe. All right, here we go. We got game number five in our Chick Fil A Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl Selectum contest. It's going to go back to Hags for number ten Notre Dame facing Virginia. Have Virginia, you guys seen, yep. uh, sorry, Steve. That's no, okay. Virginia's 5-4. and four. Notre Dame is 8-1. and one. The game is at Notre Dame Stadium. And the uh, Irish, Tim, 23-point home favorites. Some of these Notre Dame point totals, it's unbelievable, the points they're putting up. Virginia's got no shot. Hot take. No chance. I like that take. I think that's a good take. All right, your turn. Same same here. Notre Dame all the way. That's that's the lock of the week, I think, right there. Adrian. As much as I'd like to pick against Bernie, I can't hear. I'm picking the Fighting Irish. Oh, we're unanimous then. We're all going with Notre Dame. All right. Next up, number 22, Louisville taking on Stanford. The Cardinal, 2-7, and 1-5 and five in the ACC. They're hosting uh, the number 22 team in the country. Louisville, 6-3, and 4-2 and two in the ACC. Even though this game is at Stanford Stadium, Bernie, Louisville, 20-point road favorites. Uh, there's no, I, I don't think there's any question Louisville is, is, is so much better. Stanford is uh, having a really rough year this year. I, I'm, I'm going with the Cardinals. Adrian. Yeah, I got Louisville in this one, no question. All right, three for three. What about you, Tim? Yeah, Stanford losing six games in a row. I'll go with Louisville as well. Okay, now we're going to swing over to the Big Ten this week. Go to our next matchup which will feature Nebraska, 5-4, and 2-4 four. and four in the conference, taking on USC, 4-5, and 2-5 and five in the Big Ten. Nebraska's had some coaching changes this week. USC, Adrian, nine-point home favorites. Yeah, I got the Trojans of this one. It's a bounce-back uh, effort for them in this game here. Uh, the USC needs these wins under their belt in order to not only secure bowl eligibility, but maybe try to get a better bowl game when it's all said and done for the squad. I'm with you. I'll take USC as well, Tim. You know, Bernie mentioning Tom Osborne made me nostalgic, remembering those great Nebraska teams of the <laughs> 1990s when I was a kid. Remember Tommy Frazier? What a quarterback. Touchdown, Tommy Frazier. I've That's decided right. uh, to change my pick. I'm going to go with Road Nebraska upset alert. It's the Tim Haggerty nostalgia special, Bernie. Are you with Tim there? No, I am not, because USC would have a would, would be a great team to, to bring here to the Sun City and on, on New Year's Eve. But they have to win. So I'm going with USC. Okay. There we go. We have three games left. This one is going to be a good one. It's going to feature 7-2 and two Arizona State visiting 19th-ranked K-State. Kansas State, just like Arizona State, 7-2, and 4-2 two, and two in the Big 12. Game will be at Bill Snyder Family Stadium in Manhattan, Kansas State. Nine-point favorites. Again, I think the line's too high. I could see Arizona State winning. However, I am going with the home team. 
Kansas State is awfully good in Manhattan. Hags, I will take the Wildcats. Okay, uh, I'm voting for Arizona State. I enjoyed watching them play in the Sun Bowl a couple of years back, and uh, that'd be fun to have them back, so let's go with them. All right, Bernie. I am going with K-State. Again, Arizona State would be a very good football team to have here again. Uh, so th- in order for that to happen, they'd have to lose this week. I'm going I'm going with uh, Kansas State. I like that. Hags went with Arizona State because he wanted them to win to come here. You're going with K-State so they could lose and have a chance to come <laughs> here. That's good. See, Tim, this is how Bert- Bertie knows these things. This is why he's the executive director of the bowl game and we're not. That's right. All right. Adrian, your turn. You know, Scadaboo's out, or I don't know if he, he was out last game for uh, Arizona State. They're a sensational running back. I've loved watching them all season long. Without him, they're a different team. So give me Johnson and this Kansas State high-powered offense uh, like the Wildcats at home. All right, two to go. Here we go. Back to Tim for 4-5 and five Wake Forest. 2-3 and three in the ACC. Going to Chapel Hill and visiting five and four North Carolina, also two and three in the ACC. Hags, the Tar Heels, eleven and a half point home favorites. I am sticking with the spread, going with the home Tar Heels. Not much of a road game for Wake Forest, fairly close, but uh, to me, all numbers pointed towards the Heels. All right, Bertie. You know, North Carolina needs a win to become uh, bowl eligible. Uh, the word is that that Mac Brown is going to retire after this season. I would love to have North Carolina here, so I'm 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 uh, I'm hoping they become bowl eligible this week, and I am taking the Tar Heels. All right, Adrian, your turn. We could send him off, Bernie, in a, in a nice goodbye here at the Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl. Mac Brown, give me North Carolina in this matchup right here because I love that storyline, and I would love for the Tar Heels to come out here, close out the year, close out the new year, uh, or start the new year, I should say, with the Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl, uh, as um, you know they can they can play here uh, in a big matchup. So I like the idea of Mac Brown retiring in the Sun City. I'm with you. We're unanimous. We're all going North Carolina over Wake Forest. One game left to go, and it's going to feature number 21, Washington State at 8-1, visiting 4-6 and six, New Mexico at University Stadium in Albuquerque. Washington State, Wazoo, burn 12.5-point favorites on the road. Again, this is another, another, another lock. Washington State's going to win this one big. They'll even cover that number. Okay. Agent. Right. I got Washington State. I think they're going to win big. I agree. A lot of points being scored in this one, too. When you're over under a 72 and a half, that gives you an idea. Wow. Yep. I will also uh, go with the Cougars here. What about you, Tim? This is the one game that I have some personal scouting report of. I watched New Mexico play over at NMSU a month ago. They put up a lot of points. This is my first, and, you know, it might take me another 11 years to be back on this show picking football games. I'm going bold. I'm picking the Lobos. Wow. Wow. This is a top 25 team right here in Washington State. Let me tell you something. If you get this one right, I'm going to start coming to you every week for predictions. (laughs) That's for sure. So, all right. So, that gets us to our tiebreaker. Total number of points scored during the Clemson-Pittsburgh game. And for uh, reference, for that game, the total, the over-under, for Clemson and Pittsburgh is 54.5. Tim, you have honors. Let's go with 54 points. 54 points right on the total. Bernie. I'm going a lot higher than that. I am going 65. 65 for Bernie. Adrian. We always go high. I'm going to go a little lower. 49 today. 49 for Adrian. I will go 62. So 62, and that gets us in for our Chick-fil-A Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl Selectum Contest. Good luck to everybody who plays at sunbowl.org. Hags, some final thoughts. Do you feel good about your picks this week? This has been fun. Thank you, Bernie, for the invite. Great to be back on the 600 uh, airwaves. Uh, so my final thoughts are, this has been fun. Do I feel good about my picks? I have no idea. I have not seen a down from Syracuse or California this year. It's a complete shot in the dark. Uh, but who knows? Who knows? That's Maybe a good I'll win a few games. That would be great. What, what's your worst performance? Has anyone ever gone 0 for 10? No. That'd be hard to do. That would, well, I've gone 4. Yeah, I've this gone year. 4. And I went 5 was my okay. worst. So, yes. It varies. It varies. You'll, you'll be okay, though. 
hey, no baseball for the next four months, it seems like. What do you do with yourself during the offseason? I actually really enjoy the fall. It's a good time to reconnect with the Chihuahuas front office. There's already plans for next season. Um, and I'm interested next week, even though November is the slowest baseball month there is, but uh, the NL Manager of the Year features the Padres manager, Mike Schilt, and another candidate is Pat Murphy, who managed the Chihuahuas the first year and a half. Right. Uh, so that would be something if the inaugural Chihuahuas manager was NL Manager of the Year, pretty high-profile award. It really would be pretty cool. Uh, meanwhile, we are getting the Juan Soto sweepstakes. Uh, he was in San Diego uh, last year. He's a free agent. How much money do you think Juan Soto is going to get? Well, if Otani's contract was $700 million, I think it might approach that. Um, I've read today on MLB trade rumors that Boston is lining up, the Yankees, the Mets, and I think that's what's going to raise that value is that there's so many different teams. This is not a player that there's only one or two going against each other. Yep. There might be a handful of teams putting in some serious offers. Toronto also with that. Mix. Isn't Otani getting paid for two players, though, <laughs> with that $700? You know, exactly, that's, yeah. That's, he could be back pitching players. next year. Exactly. Right. That's two players. But you know that question that you asked him, you know, what do you do now that baseball season's over now? Yes. What do you do the rest? You know, I get that question on January 1. What do you do the rest of the year? We have about 16 <laughs> different events throughout the year. <laughs> you know, it does not slow down, and I know it doesn't slow down for Tim or any of us because we're working constantly. Again, we got the parade in a couple of weeks, November 28th. You know, we just had our, our, uh, we just had our, our art exhibit. You know, we got the basketball tournament. We got the flag football tournament. We got so many things going on throughout the year. But when you ask them now, now that foot baseball is over, what are you doing? People think, oh, I play golf all the rest of the year. Uh, we are always busy, and I know Tim is, and I, you know, and I am, and you know, all of us are busy. So it's, uh, it's that's why we enjoy our jobs. How are our tickets pacing for the game? I don't want to. I, I don't want to jinx anything, but we are. We yeah, wood right behind you. You could knock on that. We are way ahead of last year's. Good for you. Way ahead of last year's ticket sale, year to date. So very happy with it. I think, I think Notre Dame brought out a lot of people that have not never been to the Sun Bowl out, and now I hope they had such a good time that they want to come back, regardless of who's playing. And that's what I tell people. You know, we, uh, you know, we always, you know, we pick, uh, we pick the schools with the name, you know, with the name on the front, not the one on the back. So it makes no difference who we're, uh, you know, who it is. We're going to get some quality teams here. Like I said, we've had over 90 universities playing in the Sun Bowl, and we've had, like I said, four. You know, we've had four uh, uh, Heisman Trophies winners. We've had 123 first-round draft draft picks. We've had 1,300 draft picks altogether. We bring some pretty good people in here, so I uh, hope everybody realizes that. Uh, and uh, buy your tickets. Let's uh, let's sell it out. Let's show the nation what we have here. You mentioned those stars that played here. I was in the Oklahoma City baseball press box, and there was a guy there who worked for the Oklahoma City, excuse me, Oklahoma State University Cowboys as the SID the year they played here, the year Barry Sanders was here. And he told me about this bus trip that the Cowboys took over to Juarez. Yes. And I said, so Barry Sanders was hanging out in Juarez? And he said, absolutely. I mean, what an image. The great running back. And Thurman Thomas. Wow. And Mike Gundy. What year is this? 87. And... Major Harris was on the West Virginia on the West Virginia team. It was an incredible game. The game was incredible. Finished in the snow, came down to a two point conversion. It was definitely one of my top five Sun Bowls ever. Wow. Yeah. I think the, the, second, the second Sun Bowl. Uh, wow. You mentioned the snow. It's 2015. I remember Miami versus Washington State being at yep. that game, and it. I was sitting here with these poor people from Washington who flew down, coming down to Sun City, sitting there in the snow in El Paso, <laughs> Texas. By the way. Is there anything better than watching a football game in the snow? Isn't that the greatest? It is if you're dressed appropriately and Were it, you? it can be scenic. Were you dressed appropriately? I was. I remember that Sun Bowl really well. My parents were in town. My son was born just a few weeks earlier. I had a newborn. Uh, we went out to the Sun Bowl. Um, fun game, too, well, it's Miami right. and Washington State. You know our highest rated games are the ones where, where, where it snowed? Oh, yeah. People love to see that. They, they so tune funny. in to see that. But our, some of our highest rated uh, TV rated games uh, have been the ones in the snow. I always feel like the worst weather will bring you the best TV ratings of all time. Absolutely. When you have the snow, yes. you have the crazy things that go on, the that's, turnovers, that, the, exactly the craziness. Right. Yeah. And, and you never want to even attempt to pass. But when you do, it's fun to watch. Yeah, I've read that, that the ratings numbers do back that up, that more people watch bad weather football games. Have yeah. you ever called a baseball game in the snow? Over the years? Uh, the Chihuahua's first ever game had some pregame snow at Reno, 2014. Um, as far as heavy snow, 
I've seen a game at Colorado Springs delayed because of it, but um, never actually consistent snow while the game was continuing, no. Okay, well, it's tough because you probably won't play a lot of yeah. games during a snowstorm. Like you will the Empire has waved that off. Yeah, that's very true. Back in the day when uh, Dudley Field was still intact and the Sun Kings or the Diablos were playing out there, Opening day was canceled because there was six inches of snow on the ground. Really? Yes. You wow. can see. I think there's a picture of that, you know, at Southwest University Ballpark. Oh, that's cool. It was the opening day was 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 postponed because there was about six inches of snow on the ground. Wow. That's opening day in April. I think it was like April 14th or April 19th. It was amazing here in El Paso. That's wild. Yeah. That really is. Now, how many games are you guys covering this week? Where are you flying? Just to? one. We Just were going. You. To, you know, there was about five that we could cover. But we looked at it, and uh, so I'm going to Cal. But next next week, there's going to be some good football games next week, and I think we might go to four or five next week. Excellent. All right, well, have a safe trip. We'll see you back here next week. Hags, always great to see you, and thanks for dropping by the show. Thanks for inviting me. You You're it. very welcome. This it, is awesome. The Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl Watch. We'll come back, wrap up hour two in a moment. Stay with us. Sports Talk continues, 600 ESPN El Paso. In the El Paso Metro Place, first I want to go to uh, Northeast, Gateway North and Sean Haggerty. We have a crash. Very busy intersection here, Gateway North and Sean Haggerty. We go to Central, Delta, and Manny Martinez. We have a wreck. That's Delta and Manny Martinez. You're really tapping the brakes. Uh, pretty much stop and go. I-10 East Piedras through the Reynolds area. Now, tonight, there are closures going on. I-10 East will be closed at Vinton. South Desert will be closed on Vinton Road to the south of Los Mochis. Another uh, closure that goes on tonight, I-10 Westbound between Airway and Paisano. Left lane closed. Caution in that area. Next break over some more. Leo's Restaurant, 3520 Remcon, 78 years in business. Famous tortilla soup, party trees, popular Mr. T specials, full menu, and go miners from Leo's Restaurant, 3520 Remcon, Charlie 1600, ESB El Paso. Back here on Sports Talk as we continue. We've got Sebastian Perez Navarro back with us, along with Adrian Broadus. Sal Montes, who was here a little while ago at the district, is back at the ranch at uh, 600 ESPN El Paso's River Oaks property, Schoolyard Sports Studios. He is hanging out, getting ready for UTEP basketball, coming up in just a little bit with the Miners in uh, UT Permian Basin. That's going to be happening. 6.30 countdown to tip off, 7 o'clock. John and Steve with all the action. 
600 ESPN El Paso. Yeah, and it's a, like we mentioned earlier, Steve, it's the final opportunity to watch the UTEP men's basketball team in person at the Don Haskins Center until December 7th, right? They don't have another home game on the men's side until December 7th. A lot of the UTEP basketball fans got a chance to see Kayla Thornton Day on Sunday, and now they're going to get a chance to see a men's basketball game come here tonight. Well, I'll say this. Uh, Miners did exactly what they were supposed to for Kayla Thornton Day. They won. They won big. They honored Kayla. It was an emotional ceremony. Duke was on the call on ESPN Plus on Sunday night, and I loved it. I felt like the vibe was so perfect for that particular night. Yeah, they, the pageantry was there. They just did it right. I mean, a big shout-out to that whole coaching staff, Keith Adams and everybody with UTEP Women's Basketball. They did it right, Steve. Like, by honoring a true WNBA champion like Kayla Thornton is, a world champion like she is, uh, for what she did with the New York Liberty. And there were jerseys, Steve, that people actually had signed. How cool is that? I mean, the autograph line itself was so cool post-game after the Miners got the big win against Moorhead State. I'll tell you this, too. I heard a woman call this, uh, the queue, and she was wondering why we don't do more with women's basketball. And I feel like we need to explain it a little bit, because based on our contract with Van Wagner Sports and UTEP, during conference play, the women and the men play a lot of the times at the exact same time. And we can only air one at a time. So for us, our primary contract is with men's basketball and football. But last year, for example, when the women were in the CUSA tournament, we aired women's tournament basketball games when we could. So we try to do as much as we can. We do run commercials promoting like we promoted Kayla Thornton Night, right on all three of our radio stations. But unfortunately, based on our commitments to UTEP football, men's basketball, The NFL, the Cowboys, there's just so much we can handle, and we're just not able to to broadcast as many women's basketball games as we'd like to. Yeah, and, you know, I'd also say this. We have the coaches show as well with Keith Adams joining every single, you know, week as as we get into the actual season. Steve, now we're here. We're at every other week right now. We're going to get to a coaches show here very soon with Keith Adams and head coach Joe Golding for both men's basketball and women's basketball. So we try our best to to give us, uh, to give everybody the exposure that they need for women's basketball. And this is going to be a fun women's basketball season. That's what I can definitely see from this squad i feel like that's the case too i feel like utep's gonna win their share of games and you know again keitha adams knows how to win games that's just what she's done in all her years at utep and if the miners are able to build her a little nil and 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 fans could really put that together that could really help take Keitha and the women over the top. Yeah, that's the key. I think that's what you see maybe in year two or three, where she starts to get some of those NIL players uh, in the transfer portal. Everybody else is doing it at the women's basketball level, so UTEP uh, is a little bit behind the game with it, but once uh, it gets you know fully in place under Keitha Adams, I think they'll be great. I mean, it's just the roster right now that you're really looking to reshape here in the near future. Uh, that's the biggest thing that you look at right there, but they've got some building pieces as well that you're excited about for the near future. You're right. Right. All right, uh, we've got a very special guest coming up here to begin our 6 o'clock hour. John Feinstein has, uh, is one of the best sports authors you will get anywhere. And he's got a brand new book out called The Ancient Eight, College Football's Ivy League, and the game they play today. Believe it or not, this is Feinstein's 50th book. How about that? So he's going to join us live on our 600 ESPN El Paso Longhorn Distributing Hotline next right after Sal and Sports Center, which is coming up top of the hour. We're live at the District Pub and Kitchen. Come see us as you get ready for Utah basketball. They are an hour away. Good evening. Sal Montes here with your scoreboard update for 600 ESPN El Paso. As we are on the eve of uh, UTEP and UT Permian Basin coming at you at 7 o'clock at the Haskins Center, but 30 minutes away from the uh, Longhorn Distributing Countdown to tip off with John Teicher now. It's a UTEP against UT Permian Basin. As far as some more action goes, this out of the NBA, and uh, this is group play for the NBA Cup, the second uh, go-round 
for this cup as um, it is uh, the opening day for it, so to speak. But Celtics taking on the Hawks, 54-48. to This one in the second quarter, Celtics on top. Miami taking on Detroit, and it's a 47-all game with three minutes left in the second quarter. Hornets will take, or they're taking on the Magic, rather. 52-35 Orlando, four minutes left in the second quarter. It is the Sixers and the New York Knicks, 27-25 New York on top. Two ticks left in the first quarter. Now the Raps will take on the Bucks. Utah at home playing host to Phoenix. Now uh, the Mavericks will take on the Warriors. It is Clay Thompson return to Golden State Day, if you want to put it that way. Warriors 8-2, and two, Mavs 5-5. Five and five. Timberwolves will go up against the Blazers for the nightcap as well. That one at 8 o'clock. Now uh, we talked about basketball for uh, UTEP. Let's take a look at some Conference USA teams when it comes to today's schedule. Liberty playing host to Carolina University 49-22. to Liberty on top uh, five minutes into the second half. Baylor plays host to Sam Houston and Western Kentucky taking on Campbellsville. That's a look at your Sports Center update. I'm Sal Montes. Final hour here on Sports Talk. 30 minutes to be exact as we get you ready for UTEP basketball. Coming up here with John Teicher, Steve Yellen from the Don Haskins Center. It's UTEP, UT Permian Basin. And that's going to be happening on your home for UTEP sports, 600 ESPN El Paso. But we're hanging out. we got UTEP tickets for tonight. So if you want to go but you don't have your tickets, come down and see us. 32-33 North Mesa, our home for every UTEP game. And there will be minor talk after the game. That's brought to you by our friends at Jack in the Box. Your chance to sign off on the Miners and UT Permian Basin. As we get a chance to send it out to our Longhorn Distributing Hotline. Super excited about our next guest and an opportunity to have the great John Feinstein back with us on the program. It's been a few years, but he's got a brand new book that just came out, The Ancient Eight. College football's Ivy League and uh, the game they play. In fact, uh, this is a uh, book that just got released. And John, welcome to the show. It's great to have you on, and congratulations. I understand that this is book number 50 for you in your career. What an accomplishment that is. Well, I appreciate that, and and just proves that I'm old, that I've written 50 books. But... Uh... Uh, I'm very proud of this one. It, it's different than some of the ones I've written. I've written about a lot of famous people. Um, the, many of these kids uh, in the Ivy League are not famous and never will be as athletes. They may be presidents of the United States, but uh, I, this is a book I probably wanted to do since I was a kid growing up in New York City. I was an Ivy League football fan then. I know that in Texas, uh, it's more about the SEC. It's more about the Big 12. Uh, but these are int- very interesting young men that I've written about in, in this book. And the reason I called it the Ancient Eight is in this day of realignment, uh, every 15 minutes it seems like, the Ivy League will always be eight teams. It'll always be the same eight teams, no expansion, nobody leaving. And to me, that's kind of a throwback in this era of NILs and the transfer portal, which, again, don't really exist at all in the Ivy League. Uh, so it was a lot of fun for me to get to know the young men and play football there. It's funny when you say that it's a book you've been wanting to write, really, uh, since you know you were uh, a youngster growing up in New York City. Right. I'm just curious. Um, you talked about you know the history of the league, but you also really chronicled last season. Were there right. other years you were also looking at this? And, and tell me why now, why 2023 with the book coming out today as opposed to maybe years past? Yeah, it's a very good question because I've written about the Ivy League throughout my professional career at the Washington Post. Whenever I had an excuse to do an Ivy League story, uh, I would do one because I knew the player that I interviewed or players or coaches would, would be good interviews. I interviewed 82 
players and all eight coaches for this book. Uh, and I can honestly say I didn't have a bad interview. And that's not because I'm such a great interviewer. It's because the people I interviewed had stories to tell and were willing to share them. So the question then is, why not sooner? Well, I, I've, I've batted around with, with going, as I said, writing about famous people to writing about non-famous people. I wrote a book about the Army-Navy football rivalry in 1995, which my agent and my publisher didn't want me to do. But I wanted to do it because I'd grown up as an Army fan in New York, and I covered Navy, uh, being at the Washington Post, including the David Robinson basketball team. And uh, I wanted to do uh, a book on Army-Navy, and it ended up being a bestseller, not because the kids were so interested, because what they were doing was unique, playing uh, the FBS football and going to a very tough academic and military school, two of them, Army and Navy. And so here I am years later, I had just written a book uh, on race and sports, and what I had learned from that book was that people, there are a lot of people in sports who are very important who most people don't know. Most people don't understand. Most people don't know their backstories. And I thought, maybe this is the time to go back to my roots, in effect, because I did grow up going Ivy League football games, and write a book about Ivy League football, and especially at a time when college football is in such upheaval, it was kind of cool to go back to a place which is still the same, the ancient eight. It's the same now as it was when the league was formed in 1956. And I guess my first real learning experience about how far back the league goes was when I walked into Harvard Stadium one morning for practice, and there were eight national championship banners. And the last one was in 1919. And believe it or not, I was not around back in 1919. And I, and I said to myself that this is different than what I've been covering through all these years at the, at the Post. John, when it comes to Princeton, we have uh, a friend of ours and who works with us on this radio station who not only played uh, college football at Princeton way back when, but you talk about some of the great stories like you detail in the Ancient Eight. Well, some of his roommates were like people like uh, you know Jason Garrett, who obviously goes off and then ends up playing you know in the NFL and also ends up coaching in the NFL right. as well. But you also had you know actors and movie stars in his own uh, in his own you know locker room. Uh, it was Dean Kane who ends up playing Superman uh, in the right. movies who ended up playing for Princeton at that very time. So it just tells you, it's kind of like, uh, you know, the who's who who ends up maybe being a, a part of some of these rosters. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's why, why I said uh, not many of these guys will become famous because of their football skills, although there are about 12 to 16 Ivy League players in the NFL year in and year out. So it's not like none of them make the NFL. Um, but you mentioned uh, Jason Garrett, which is interesting because uh, Princeton's starting quarterback this past season was a transfer, and he was the first football transfer at Princeton since Jason Garrett transferred in when his dad became the coach in 1988. So that shows you how different the Ivy League is. Um, you know, you have games down there all the time where you, you start the game and, and the announcers will say, well, this team, at UTEP, for example, will have 34 transfers, and that's not atypical at all in college football nowadays. In the Ivy League, there are virtually no transfers. There are no NILs. There are kids who come arrive at fre as freshmen and graduate four years later. And a, a handful go on to be good NFL players. Uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick certainly comes to mind, played in the league for 17 years, uh, and others. You can go back to the great Yale teams of the 60s with Calvin Hill and Brian Dowling, who became BD in uh Gary Trudeau's br brilliant strip Doonesbury. Um, but uh, it is different. And, and when you're in those locker rooms, which I had a chance to be last year, you meet kids who have different stories to tell than, you know, I went to this uh, football camp because I wanted to go to Michigan or uh, I wanted to go to Texas or what, whatever school you might want to talk about. These are kids who are good football players. Some of them had the chance to play at FBS schools but wanted – to play in the Ivy League because of the uniqueness of the education and the football. John Feinstein has a brand new book out today, The Ancient Eight, College Football's Ivy League, and the game they play today. You can pick it up at Amazon, Barnes & Noble locally, 
and uh, all bookstores everywhere uh, with uh, this terrific uh, account of the 2023 uh, campaign. And you talked about the tragedy with Dartmouth's uh, Buddy Stevens to kind of begin things when uh, he was struck uh, by a truck riding a bicycle and he, you know, ended up dying from his injuries uh, just days before the home opener and really just the impact that had on the entire Ivy League football community, including fellow coach uh, Tim Murphy from Harvard. Why don't we talk a little bit about that as well? Well, that's all well put. Uh, Buddy Stevens was a graduate of Dartmouth was an all-Ivy quarterback, was also a hockey player on Dartmouth's Frozen Four team in 1979. He was that good an athlete. And then coached at Dartmouth in the late 80s, early 90s, moved up to Tulane and then Stanford, did not succeed at either place. He was meant to be at Dartmouth, and he returned to Dartmouth in 2005 and rebuilt what had been a fallen program, won a bunch of Ivy League titles, but was more than just the Dartmouth football coach. He was the guy who first came up with the notion that college coaches need to do something proactive about brain injuries. And he he cut way back on all hitting in, in Dartmouth practices. It didn't affect them negatively during games. And the Dartmouth scientists also came up with a machine that you put on the field and you turn it on and it shows players how to tackle properly, how to wrap up, how to not use your head, how to not lean with your head. And colleges all over the country are using that machine now. Uh, Buddy Tevens was also part of, of uh, founding the Manning Passing Camp uh, when he was at Tulane. He was good friends with Eli Payton and Archie. And uh, during the camp in 2023, after his, his accident, uh, all the counselors wore T-shirts that said, Buddy Strong. Uh, as you said, he passed away on the Tuesday before the home opener a year ago, September. I was lucky enough to be in the Dartmouth locker room the day of that game. And Sammy McCorkle, who took over the program, he worked for Buddy for 19 years, uh, in the wake of his accident, gave one of the great speeches I've ever heard. I still tingle when I think about it and being in that locker room that day. And Dartmouth, unbelievably, after all that had gone on, they lost a player to cancer. They had been 3-7. and seven. Then Buddy's death unbelievably tied for the Ivy League title last year. They were picked sixth in the league, and they ended up tying for the title. And right now, they're tied for first place this year. So what an amazing story about Sammy McCorkle and all those kids. John, when it comes to just El Paso kids, we've had uh, you know our share of kids from the local area go off and play in the Ivy Leagues. Mm. A couple names come to mind. Connor Potts played for Harvard not too long ago at the center right. position. And then uh, Gustavo Dorsett, he, le- he leaves to go to Cornell. But the funny thing is some of these guys stick it out four years. Other guys, maybe two years, and then career gets the best of them. Like They got great career opportunities because of their academics going on you know, behind the scenes have you seen similar stories as well where maybe guys don't continue the football side of well, things and they just stick stick out the a- academics yeah it's a very good question because what happens is a lot of these kids are so smart they graduate in three years and go on to, to law school or med school or into business on wall street um these are really bright kids and you you don't when you use the term one one and done you're not talking about ivy league football players you're talking about ivy league uh, students uh, who leave maybe after two or three years because they get an opportunity. Many of them go and have internships on Wall Street, and they do so well they're asked to stay on, and they'll, they'll, they'll re- their football careers will end, but their academic careers won't end. And it's funny because when I was getting ready to talk to you, uh, I was thinking about the fact that even though Texas is a long way from the Ivy League, there are a lot of kids from Texas who go on to play in the Ivy League because there are so many great football players who come out of Texas, as you well know. John, when you look at just the overall talent pool, everybody looks at academics first. So when you are able to have that exceptional player that can excel in the classroom but also play on Sundays, that's just an added bonus, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And as I said, the Ivy League generally speaking, has between a dozen and 16 players in the NFL at any given time because they do produce some very good football players. And you mentioned your colleague from Princeton. Uh, Princeton last 
spring graduated a young man named Jalen Travis, who was such an outstanding prospect that at one game where he was supposed to play but hurt, there were a dozen NFL scouts at the game who didn't get to see Jalen play that day. He played the next week. But um, he's a young man who, who had a 3.7 GPA at Princeton while being an, a standout football player. And when he was a senior in high school after the George Floyd murder, he grew up in Minneapolis, he and a friend of his formed a foundation to raise money to help inner-city kids in Minneapolis get the education they needed to go to college. An 18-year-old kid. You know, I'm a lot older than that, and I haven't ever accomplished anything that impressive. And and that's what you run into. You walk into an Ivy League locker room, and they'll point out, oh, there's Jalen Travis. This is what he did. There's somebody else. This is what he did. And uh, they're a remarkable group of young men who happen to be good football players. Well, and that's the key, because, John, I have a lot of listeners that over the years have always said with NIL and the transfer portal and how it's changed the game of college athletics and college football that – academics and scholarships should be the most important things. And considering the fact that the Ivy League doesn't even offer athletic scholarships and they don't have donor-funded collectives, if you really want to look at just the education aspect of playing college athletics, the Ivy League is the most pure form today that anybody that follows college athletics and college football is going to get. Yeah, you're at, that's one of the reasons I wanted to do the book was because I knew that's what I would find. That I would, I, that the, as you said, NILs really don't exist in the Ivy League. Transfer por- portal really doesn't exist. As I said, Princeton just had their first transfer in 35 years, uh, last season. Uh, and most schools don't have any transfers at all. Uh, and that's, that's what the Ivy League is. And if you, if you want to go and, and see, uh, seats filled with a uh, stadium filled with a hundred thousand people. I have nothing against that. I covered games like that for years. But to go <laughs> and spend a year on on the sideline at the Ivy League and feel the intensity of the players because they care every bit as much about their football as the guys playing in the SEC or the Big Twelve or the Big Ten or the Big Fifty, whatever it is now. Um, but they care every bit as much. They are just as emotional about football. Uh, they're going to miss it when they graduate from college. Most of them know that's the end for them. And yet they, they are also excellent students. As I said, I mentioned Jalen Travis. He's not an exception. He's a lot closer to the rule. If there's one thing you hope your readers will take away from the ancient eight, what would that be, John? That these young men have great stories to tell, that you don't have to be uh, 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 you know, a, a superstar, a multimillionaire to have a, a great story to tell and that the Ivy League plays pretty damn good football. They don't get the credit they deserve because the presidents, for some reason, don't want the league champion to play in the FCS playoffs. And I happen to believe that if they did, they would impress people. Last season, when I was doing the book, Harvard played Holy Cross during the regular season, obviously, uh, Holy Cross had been in the semifinals of the S- FCS tournament the year before, and they came in ranked fourth in the country. Harvard beat them. And I, I hope people will come away with the understanding that these aren't just geeks who happen to play some football. These are very good football players who are also very good students. And in many cases, people we're going to hear about in later years having nothing to do with football. I mean, if Jalen Travis doesn't go on to do something special, I'll be stunned. It's the Ancient Eight, college football's Ivy League, and the game they play today. John Feinstein's been our guest. Book just got released today. One of the best around to tell any sports story. It's this man. John, appreciate the conversation. Thanks so much. And, uh, again, really uh, happy to have a chance to have you talk about uh, the Ancient Eight. Thanks for having me, as always. I really appreciate it. From John Feinstein back over to Charlie One. We've got a traffic update, then we'll come back and head back to the arena and wrap things up here on Sports Talk. It's traffic and then UTEP Hoops, 600 ESPN El Paso. Imagine beautiful new windows and doors that elevate your space and keep you comfortable year-round. At Renewal by Anderson, we specialize in custom-built, energy-efficient windows and doors that are crafted to last. 
And just for our first 20 podcast listeners, mention our podcast offer and receive 20% off your entire project. Save now. Visit bestwindowsflorida.com to schedule your free in-home consultation. License number CGC 1527613.